Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. <laughs> We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom. My name is Eric, and I'm here today with ship mascot Michael Kester. <laughs> and, uh, oh, you weren't anticipating that, were you? I love that line. Oh, fuck. Michael, this is... I am so happy to be here today. Man, we <laughs> really, really... We stepped in it hard with this pair. This is uh, Dark Star and Sunshine. Yeah. The John Carpenter film and the Danny Boyle yeah. film. Uh, Two great tastes that go great together. Um, we're going to spoil both of the movies. And uh, you can use the chapters to skip the spoilers and go directly. You can skip this conversation, go right into the films, <laughs> or you could skip over the film you haven't seen. Which I, you know, that's my intention with sure. the chapters. Everybody else thinks we just have chapters to pad twenty five seconds in the beginning. Of and every... you know what would be really funny is if you could just send us an email about talking about chapters more, because those are endlessly hilarious emails. Everyone, keep uh, doing that. You're ruining what I was going to say at the end of the show, which is something about emails and what. No, no, no. One. We got to start with Dark Star. Right, Dark Star is a sixteen millimeter mono John Carpenter film. That's right. So that's where you begin. No, let's put it another way. Sure. Dark Star is the sixteen millimeter <laughs> sixteen millimeter mono John Carpenter film. Have we not done every John Carpenter film ever made? There's a patch of John Carpenter in the nineties that I'm a little unfamiliar with. Um, I feel like we've even covered uh John Carpenter movies he hasn't made yet. Yeah. I feel like everything has been tackled. And then stuff like Dark Star comes up, which is uh First film? Is that right? It's his very first film. I think it was uh, technically almost a student film. You'd never know that by looking no. at it, Michael. It <laughs> doesn't look like it was filmed in a broom closet or and anything. And this, I mean, anybody who watched this was probably thrown who listens to Double Feature when it was funny. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. It's a comedy. It's a, it's a, it's the, uh, what is it? The spaced out odyssey. Oh, I'm sorry. You mean they were thrown that Dark Star was funny, not they were thrown because they used to listen to Double Feature when Double Feature was funny. Right. Yeah, that's Okay. True. <laughs> Those could be the same people, though. Those are not mutually exclusive That's things. True. Yeah, uh, it's a comedy. That's kind of fucked yeah. up. And it's also, it's Dan O'Bannon, right? Right. So Dan O'Bannon plays Pinback. All right. So we should probably talk Dan O'Bannon before we even get into the, the Carpenter stuff. Oh, absolutely. Because when you say it's a couple of these minds coming together, right. you don't mean John Carpenter and his wife. No. You mean John Carpenter and Dan O'Bannon. Right. Uh, who is this guy? Well, we've we've talked about something Dan O'Bannon's created on the show already. Heavy Metal Magazine. Oh, no. That's, we haven't done... I don't know how Double Feature has not done Heavy Metal. I think, because I think the honest reason is because Rodriguez bought the rights to it. Oh, we're and just And we're waiting, waiting for that one. Waiting around. <laughs> um, Dan O'Bannon uh -huh. wrote Alien. Yeah. The, uh, the you know, the uh, pre-Prometheus. <laughs> is uh, that what that the is? The sequel to Prometheus. Oh, okay. Yeah, he wrote Alien. He wrote a bunch of big sure. sci-fi movies. Well, he did all that Philip K. Dick stuff. Right. Did uh, Total Recall. Yeah. And what was the more um, the obscure one nobody but me saw? Blade Screamers. Runners. Oh, oh, Screamers. No. <laughs> Blade Runner. <laughs> yeah, no one but me saw Blade Runner. Have you seen Screamers? I haven't. It's but I know what it weird, looks like because I, I used to go to Video Value back yeah, in St. Charles, Illinois. <laughs> and it was one go. of those horror movie shelves that I would walk by when I was renting. I love know. that Video Value is not a joke. That's actually a place right. that you went growing up. That's great. Um, he also directed Return of the Living Dead. Return the, of the Living right. Dead. The uh, It's Time to Party. It's Party Time. Yes, that one. Um, that one, sure. Yeah, Return of the Living Dead is possibly it's it has nothing to do with the of the Living Dead series, the Romero series. Um, it's kind of this weird '80s punk version of zombies. Sure, sure. Uh, very culty. It's hilarious, but it it lends itself to why this happened, as opposed to something like Alien, which has no sense of humor. Sure, right. Whereas Dark Star is unrelentingly funny as long as you give it the time of day well as long as you know it's supposed to be funny. right that's true because <laughs> it it because of the production style on dark star you err on the side of do they know this is funny or sure. is this supposed to be serious and they're just all horrible well, i get the feeling that the people who made it knew it was supposed to be funny and that's where it ended i think <laughs> you're right yeah that no one involved with production marketing getting the film into a theater or watching the film the, the rest of the chain there sure just uh completely no idea right do you think john carpenter knew it was supposed to be funny I think John Carpenter knew. Okay. John Carpenter wrote Benson, Arizona. 
He knew oh, it was supposed I to be I did funny. not know that John Carpenter wrote Ben's <laughs> he did, Arizona. Yeah. He didn't uh he didn't sing it, but uh he wrote it. I love that song in so this I film. So I feel like he's got to know. Sure. Right? He's got to know. He uses it fucking it's twice in the twice. movie, right? The opening and the closing. Yeah, in the most strange places to put it. So Dan O'Bannon's writing a comedy here. Mm-hmm. Uh John Carpenter's filming a comedy. And this has to be I mean <laughs> Is this the only comedy John Carpenter's ever done? You know, I like I said, I haven't actually seen every John Carpenter movie, but... What's the next funniest thing he's done? Well, he did an Elvis movie starring Kurt Russell. Okay. Um, there's also <laughs> right. Big Trouble in Little China. That is... Oh, yeah, you're and right. Escape from L.A. is a tongue-in-cheek comedy. I always forget Big Trouble in Little China. Yeah, I, don't know I mean, why he, did, he did some comedies, and I'm pretty sure Starman is probably funny. It's probably <laughs> a lot like Kate Pax. Yeah, um, Ghost of Mars is funny, right? Is no. that the name of that film? Ghosts of Mars with Ghosts Ice of tea. Mars. There's several ghosts. Ice Cube, not Ice Tea. Damn it. Can we talk about Ice Cubes for a minute while we're on the... Wow, that was a great transition. Wow. Uh, Ice Cube Trays. This movie was made with shit sitting around John Carpenter's apartment. Yep. <laughs> I mean, it's Ice Cube Trays and muffin tins and sure. things that were later stolen and used on the set of Christmas from Mars. Right. That's... Uh, it's not stolen because it's just a pile of junk. Right. It's let's dig through the trash and sure. see what we can make our sci-fi film out of. And I feel like everyone forgot that from Dark Star to Christmas on Mars. Yeah. You don't, for all of the, ooh, look, prolific sci-fi film, you don't see enough ice cube trays sure. in science well, fiction. What it's kind of It's kind of funny because it just points out how psychedelic and weird our everyday things can be sure if you take them out of their actual use sure like imagine just i mean as a thought experiment imagine instead of paneling your walls yeah you just tack up a bunch of ice cube trays sure. and immediately how strange your place becomes ah but very sci-fi yeah very sci- you have a strange sci-fi room i wonder if we could use that for soundproofing in here maybe donate.doublefeatureshow.com uh if we get enough donations this week i will use them to buy Ice trays, and we will pat our studio and report in next week and see what happens. Christmas on Mars kind of has that that hippie, uh, oh yeah, sci-fi thing. What is the hippie sci-fi thing? So is that a thing? It's yeah, I think that John Carpenter. I mean, so the thing that a lot of people forget about John Carpenter is that mm-hmm. he's a child of the late sixties and early seventies. Sure, I, I don't mean, forget that. <laughs> look at the cast of this film; yeah. they're all fucking flower children. I mean, post flower children. Yeah. You know, they're all hippies and the burnout types they'll have long ridiculous hair and sure they uh they make the statement that it's been what three years since they've been in space so maybe that's why they look like fucking hippies sure but there's this weird thing that i think has always been latched onto which is you take the hippie culture you know and their psychedelic drugs and they're you know Mm. there's more out there than just this planet man yeah right and you actually put them in space sure and you see what it's like when the hippie culture is actually confronted with the vast everything. Sure. You know, when you basically take a hippie and put them inside their mind. Yeah. And I think that's what Dark Star is really about. It's about taking the hippie generation and putting them in a place where all the possibilities of the world, man. Sure. Where sure. everything is out there and there's Phoenix asteroids, dude. And, you know, you're not supposed to use that gun in here, man. And Yeah. The mentality of facing somebody with their own thought process and putting them face to face with the way they are and then going, also, there's the technical side. Sure. Figure that out. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Because none of them know what they're doing. As if all astronauts were hippies. Right. What would that look like? And Pinback has that wonderful, the wonderful um, conversation while they're eating their ice, their flavor ice dinners. Sure. Yeah. Uh, where he talks about how the actual pinback killed himself in front of him. Sure. And he put on the suit, the space suit, so that he could go and save him from the rocket fuel. Yeah. Meanwhile, the other, you know, the space team saw this guy in a space suit labeled pinback and shuffled him on board. <laughs> and now he's, right. he's up there and nobody respects him because they don't see his good quality. I mean... I love the fact that they're up in space and it's they have the testimonial style reality show in 70, what, 72, 74? I'm sorry, you just said up in space and I thought up in smoke and then I thought Cheech and Chong in space. Wow. Which, uh, one, is a little bit of this movie, but two, should have been its own yeah, movie. Yeah, definitely Why should've. is Cheech and Chong in space not a film? Uh, Leprechaun was there first. It's, um, there's too many leprechauns in space, not yeah. enough room. You know, the problem with space is it's becoming overpopulated. Yeah, it's getting days. crowded up there. That well, that's why we gotta you gotta you know take 
take care of all the unstable planets. So that is the plot of the film, by the way. I'm sorry, plot of the film? The, uh, the one thing that's going on, and it, it's not about chasing beach balls, and it's not about, you know, whether or not Talby needs to be or not be R2-D2. Right. Uh, it's about this team of astronauts who are going and finding unstable planets to explode so that they don't spiral into the suns and create supernovas. I don't think anything spirals in this movie. I think it just moves until it stops. Dead stop. <laughs> yeah. It's, man, your effects do not have to be good if they are funny. Yeah. <laughs> the way the uh, Star Destroyers, they're just Star Destroyers. Yeah. The way Star Destroyers stop immediately. Yeah. Can, okay. Yeah. We should talk about the Star Destroyers. Okay. So and the R2-D2. And can we just be really honest about this? Yeah. So we were watching the film. Uh -huh. The film began. Uh, we see the Dark Star, the, the ship. Yeah. Um, and we see the little R2-D2 dome on top, and it's making R2-D2 noises. Sure. And, uh, the, I mean, it's moving like the Star Destroyer. The camera angles are in the same spot. Obviously, it's not doing the innovative make a model move the camera around it right that george lucas got so much acclaim for it's that dan o'bannon did the fucking special effects yeah. for so we're watching it and we're you know haha i can't believe you know they're so blatantly ripping off star wars the 70s was so crazy wait when did this come out yeah so we should pause for a second <laughs> now you and i are we're fans of star wars like we're fans of any movies uh -huh. we like movies and we like movies that are notable and they do things um, I kind of grew up, those were really the only movies I grew up uh -huh. with. I've talked a lot on the show about how I just didn't watch any fucking movies until about six years ago. Now I'm doing a movie show. Why do people listen to this? I don't know. Uh, but I watched Star Wars. I watched it a ton. I know all the canon. And now that I've seen other films, we don't do Star Wars on the show. Right. But we have been talking a lot more Star Wars lately. Yeah. And we've been talking a lot more Star Trek lately. And I'm starting to see the Star Wars things show up in other places. Right. Not in the order, I would assume. <laughs> I would assume Star Wars is a giant, iconic thing that happened, and then everyone copied it. Like, Dark Star copied it, right. you know, with its R2-D2 in the beginning, and its clear rip-off Star Destroyer scene. But this movie came out years before, right. <laughs> before A New Hope did, before the, uh, the first Star Wars film uh -huh. came out. You know, you're just watching it thinking, this is Spaceballs. Yes. This has to be sure. a parody. And what are you thinking when you find out it actually came out years before Star Wars existed? What you initially think is if you're me and you prefer John Carpenter to George Lucas, uh, not that anybody else has to agree with that sentiment, you start thinking George Lucas ripped up. I mean, George Lucas is paying homage yeah. to John Carpenter's groundbreaking college film. Sure, sure. <laughs> yeah, that's that's one thing that could be happening there. Uh, um, I mean, Dan O'Bannon could be recycling sure. a little bit. Right. There's always the fact that there is a carryover of yeah. personnel. Yeah. Not, I mean, of the the much larger team that made A New Hope, uh, doesn't account for the entire visual effects department or anything. I think it's it's best in our best interest, given our limited information on anything. Uh, Great. I like this premise. To assume that George Lucas either had never seen Dark Star and the things are just coincidental or snuck in by Dan O'Bannon. Sure. Or George Lucas did see Dark Star and decided to pay homage to it by making a giant, pretty-looking Dark Star and putting little R2-D2 with the same noises. That's probably the safest route to go. Sure. Otherwise, we're going to get... I mean, we're we're walking in dangerous territory. We we're are. on a film show sure. on the brink of calling out Star Wars <laughs> as not being the first to do something. Well, it's okay, man, because Dark Star is a movie nobody has seen or cares about besides you and I. Right. So uh, no one's going to listen to this and call us out on it. <laughs> well, George Lucas has cited... I mean, he's pretty open about, oh, I was influenced by this or influenced sure. by that. But those things aren't Dark Star. None of them are Dark Star. They're always Italian. <laughs> are they Italian? I was going to say they're always samurai films, but that's fine too. Everything's a samurai film. No, I mean, he's talked about the, the films of the 70s, and this film itself is kind of a parody of um, 2001. 2001, not 2001, right. right? We can call it 2001. It's, I mean, that's the tagline. The tagline is the spaced out space odyssey or yeah, something sure. like that. And then there's the other 70s sci-fi stuff that kind of shows up in here too. So, you know, common inspirations, uh, how it's, it's like thinking of um, evolution, apes as a common, uh, having a common ancestor, sure. not transforming into humans. Right. That's how I'm going to choose to think about the sure. sci-fi genre. There's just a common ancestor somewhere back there. You and I are ignorant of it. Yep. 
Although it would be fitting if we just made it Planet of the Apes. That'd yeah, be fine. I guess All so. sci-fi films are now a ripoff of Planet of the Apes. There. <laughs> we've solved it. Except for Alien, which is a ripoff of Dark Star. <laughs> So I love that, uh, and maybe you'll disagree with me about this, and oh, that's okay. I don't think we'll disagree. I think we love this film for the same reasons. Alien is just the scene where they're chasing the beach ball down the corridor. Yeah, here, right. Absolutely. They're chasing Nick Castle, who is Michael Myers later, uh-huh. who plays Michael Myers, plays a giant beach ball in this film. I like his earlier work, giant beach ball. Uh huh. Um, just chasing him around for oh, I don't know, twenty minutes of the yeah. film, and it's funny in here because they drag it out like uh, one of those SNL sketches that yeah. was predicated upon only half of a joke and then sure. just 20 minutes long, or one of the SNL movies, perhaps. Yeah. But uh, here's the setup. There's going to be a beach ball. You're there's chasing a, it around. You wind up in a, you're winding up in a corridor. <laughs> there's an elevator. Um, an that elevator. was That's pretty much alien, right? I yeah. mean, am I wrong here? No, you're dead on. It's It's about seeking out this dangerous menace who's aboard your ship and making sure that it doesn't cause any more chaos. In this case, it's a head-humping beach ball. Right. In Alien, it's a different force. I but mean, not funny at all, yeah. which is the really crazy right. thing. See, this is why I wonder about Dan O'Bannon. Uh, Dan O'Bannon was kind of a crazy guy, right? Yeah. I don't know a lot about him. He, he, had, a uh, lot of, he had a lot of crazy going on. Yeah, some good crazy, some bad crazy. Some potential medical issues or yeah. something he might have covered up that was perhaps part of his crazy. But I don't know a lot about him. Now, I see him writing a comedy here, taking one of his comedy scenes... And then the movie Alien is mm-hmm. what becomes that. I see some strange influence, some ties in Star Wars, but we don't really know what's going on sure. there. And so I don't know how much of these projects he worked on he controlled, but I do see where very easily uh, if Dan O'Bannon hadn't written Alien, Ridley Scott is the type of person who would have watched this beach ball scene and then prolifified it sure. and made, a, made the, the film Alien right. out of it, you know? So it's an interesting way you can kind of start to recognize somebody else's work and learn more about the people they worked with as a result. Sure. You could take a guess what Dan might have brought to the table and learn more about Wrigley Scott yeah. uh, as a result of that. So we've been talking about this uh, this shaft scene. They're completely the shaft scene. Yeah. milking here. I guess I probably don't want to use milking and shaft right next to it. No, actually I, I do. do yeah. yeah, I do. Uh, the director's cut of this film is shorter than the regular yeah. <laughs> cut. It's actually they're cutting the film down, uh-huh. which is what one upon first glance might expect the word director's cut to mean. Right. Uh, not necessarily the director's original vision. Right. Or maybe it was the director's original well, vision. Well, I think it was because... Uh, how original are we talking here? We talked about how the film was initially 45 minutes long. Sure. And <laughs> well, they, you mentioned it being shorter. Yeah. And they had to uh, extend the film to make it feature length as as some would call it I so think the director's feature cut length is... is the word you use for worth your ten dollars at the theater right right in length not in quality sure people um, expect to be entertained for a certain amount of time sure, and you're... if they leave after 40 minutes they may people, want their money back people go to the theater not buying the film they go to the theater buying something to do other than talk to their children for 90 minutes right or that's what that people 90 assume minutes anyways. is 40 minutes sure they're gonna want their money back sure that's what the producers think sure. i don't know how true that actually is I do know a lot of uh, theaters will give you your money back in the first half hour or hour right. of the film. And if so, the film's under an hour, then everyone gets their money back. These are not concerns the producers had. But for whatever arbitrary reason, uh-huh. films need to be a certain length. I mean, I don't know which scenes were added, but I'm guessing the beach ball and elevator scene. Yeah. Those are, that's my guess. The elevator the scene is so long. Now, I haven't seen the director's cut, I have. but is that missing some of that it's stuff, missing or? a lot of stuff okay uh, so it is actually about 45 minutes or so yeah it's close to an hour wow that's crazy does it still include the end conversation with the oh, robot thing yeah it does and i think it's actually longer in the director's cut because <laughs> i think that's the crux of the film this is so when he's talking to the robot bomb thing the bomb bomb 20 this is a conversation we would actually have on our show but without the intention of being funny. Right. They have, I mean, there's no, there's nothing that makes it different in this movie. They just have the conversation and in the context, you know, it's funny. Right. Rather than us being. Well, it's the, it's the, uh, the quintessential, do you truly know you exist outside there, outside your mind? Sure. And it's, it's Doolittle talking to this bomb, trying to convince the bomb not to explode and the bomb saying, but I am programmed to explode. Right. Yeah. And it's Doolittle basically trying to get an artificially intelligent being to question its own programming. Sure. He's trying to basically instigate actual 
free thought in a machine. Right. Which, I mean, absolutely the poster child for hippie space comedy. Sure. Um, also, your alternative to just giving the machine a paradox sure. to think about. That's the other way right. to, uh, to destroy a machine. And he eventually convinces the bomb to think about its own existence and whether or not its programming is even worth you know paying attention Great. to perfect everything seems like it's roses yeah until the bomb decides there is no beginning there is no end when i was created there sure. was darkness the bomb becomes god yeah it it feels, gets a little existential yeah it's, it, uh, it realizes that by only knowing its own creation as itself it must be god sure and kills uh the two pinback and the other character that yeah. just blows up they die you think that they're the main characters they're just toast and the the old space captain goes flying in his ice tomb out into space, sure. gurgling some words of wisdom. I mean, the existentialism at that point just compounds. Well, don't forget, this is also uh, Silver Surfer, later still right. pre yeah. premise. From, <laughs> well, we're just making up things that didn't steal anything from Dark Star. Why don't we <laughs> chuck that in there? What I uh, really like about this conversation, and we won't have the conversation because sure. the film, I feel like, calls us out uh -huh. on it. Uh, since it thinks it's funny, I don't want the film to also be making fun of us in retrospect. But it's um, it's existentialism and it's methodological skepticism, right? Kind of um, you know opening the doorway to existentialism. It's a lot of that. I mean, it was that uh, Rene Descartes stuff in the 1600s, mm -hmm. right? That um, approach to skepticism that would arise from someone challenging their own beliefs, right? Or just, uh, I guess, having doubt in all of your beliefs. Mm -hmm. This uh, way of analyzing what could be known and extrapolating from that or kind of breaking things down to its minimal components. What are our knowns in a given situation and what can we figure out and, and derive from that? Which is, I mean, I love it as an alternative to a paradox. I love that mm -hmm. you have several minutes to talk to this machine and he actually tries to take... You know, he tries to use skepticism to have a conversation right. with the machine rather than when it, anytime new uh, fake AI comes out, when Siri came out on the iPhone, you know, you sure. talk to it. It's not voice commands. You just say things and it figures stuff out. First thing I always try and do, because I buy all of that stuff. I have a connect just so I can wave my arms around in the living room. I don't even use it to play games. But I love feeding paradoxes to AI. Because I assume at some point... It's just going to blow up. Nerdy programmers will build something into it to deal with paradoxes. And I'm just waiting for robots to solve paradoxes for uh -huh. me. Or to attempt to. To break the technology I just bought. I only do this within the return period of the technology <laughs> I buy. It's very important. Uh, let's talk about Sunshine. So Sunshine is Double Feature's first Danny Boyle film. I don't know how that's possible either. Well, he he does he's all over the place with his movies, and yeah. I think Sunshine is probably the best place to start. Yeah, Sunshine I think is my favorite Danny Boyle film. Yeah, which is, I don't think is common for most people when they think yeah, Danny it's Boyle. Weird. But you know, Twenty Eight Days Later to uh, Slumdog Millionaire. Uh huh. Um, what was One Hundred and Twenty Seven Hours? Twenty Seven Hours. The name of that? Yeah. Yeah. There's just a lot of I mean, a variety, and that's not even talking about his earlier stuff. He, uh, you're right, he's worked in a lot of different genres. I think some people would call that a kind of a journeyman filmmaker, sure. somebody who um, plays in all of these different arenas right. uh, as a way to kind of exercise their muscle a little bit, uh, learn a lot of different crafts, different mm -hmm. ways to tell a story. And there might be another day to explore Danny Boyle, but there's so much going on in Sunshine and being the first yeah. time we've considered a, a director on the mm -hmm. show before. Maybe not the best time to launch into a giant Danny Boyle thing. Yeah, agreed. Um, we have talked Rose Byrne on the show before. Yep. So she's um, uh, she plays the only person whose name I can pronounce in this film, uh -huh. Cassie, which means I will instantly talk about her more than everyone else. <laughs> and then uh, Chris Evans is in this. Uh, the Avengers? That's weird. Also Scott Pilgrim. Was Chris Evans in Scott? Oh, yeah. It just proves that everyone is in fucking superhero movies. Yeah. Killian Murphy also yep. in superhero movies. Mm -hmm. I adore Killian Murphy, and I'm not really sure why, but I, I feel like maybe I shouldn't poke at that too much. Uh -huh. I'm just going to like that I enjoy sure. Killian Murphy. It's best, if you find you like something, it's best to stop there. <laughs> yeah, just to run away from it. in any situation, once you like something, stop. Good. Stop figuring that I'm out. I'm on board with Killian Murphy. <laughs> Let's not watch any of his films. <laughs> Um, no, I'm always generally happy with him, if not the, the movies he's in. 
it's uh it's like wanting to do a Christina Ricci, Killian Murphy double feature with those Wes Craven movies. Uh huh. What was the the pen throat movie he was in? That Red was Eye. Red Eye. That was and it. she was in Cursed. Oh god. And Wes Craven is still the the worst, absolute worst. Yeah, look out for um Cursed and Red Eye on double feature. Uh, <laughs> that'll be another year ten. We'll. That'll I hope just, someone's writing down all these. That year should 10. be just a year ender some year. <laughs> yeah, Cursed and Red Eye. Oh, and it's a movie that focuses on the human element a lot. But I want to talk about space before we talk about the characters. There's a lot of space. In there, this movie. there is a lot of space, Michael. Thank well, you. Well, one of the things that I think is most interesting to me about the use of space, and I mean space, I'm trying to figure out a way to separate what I mean by space when I mean outer space and actually room in a frame. Oh, yeah. Um, you could do the thing I do where I just make no difference between sure. the two and, and then no one can, will figure it out. Yeah, no one will figure out what people have to draw a diagram of your sentences. Well, buffalo, yeah. buffalo, 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 buffalo. In the film, there's a lot of wide open shots of outer space, mm -hmm. but there really is no open area in the frame because everything is moving. Yeah. And there's no background because even the background has motion. Yeah, I right. mean, it's all kind of um, the shots are always a weird panorama of three or four things moving at separate speeds. Sure. And uh, there's never a definitive spot where the motion ends. Yeah. So you have even when the background is the background will be, say, the sun. That will be the furthest back thing. Yeah. If you were to be in Photoshop and click arrange send to back, wow. the sun is the thing that Thanks goes back that. there. But the sun has all the swirling and the fire and the sunspots. Um, I likened it when we were talking about it. I likened it to the old vaudevillian 1920s, 1930s yeah. gimmick of showing the water behind the characters by sure. taking wooden panels and moving them opposite each other sure. up and down. Um, to see the waves move, you know, you, I'm sure people can figure yeah, out. Yeah, vaudeville, Photoshop. And, uh. I'm more of a Pixelmator guy, but yeah, I see where you're going sure. with this. There's no matte black. This is the depth of infinite space. Yeah. It, it shows the life of space. A lot of layers, a lot and, of components moving yeah, around. And it's a lot of, you know, what it's like. It's, it's, it's a very interesting it's a very interesting statement in that it shows that space is more alive than open dead. You know, nothing is going on out here. And I, I think that's that. what plays into a lot of the ideology when we get to the end of the film. Sure. One of my favorite things about sunshine is, uh, you know, taking that other approach to space, a movie about the fucking sun. Sure. Right? When the you see a dying. space movie about the sun. Yeah. And the sun's dying, but everything around the sun still seems to be flourishing. Sure. You know, we show, uh, I mean, we're focusing on the lives of the crew, but also on the ship. This isn't, you know, when you think about setting up template for space movie, right? everything is cold and still. And, and there's infinite. always that scene in the fucking space movie where there's no sound and everybody points at it like it's the first time that's ever been uh -huh. done. Oh, isn't it cool they didn't put any sound in here? And then we have to start talking about a space odyssey again and... You know, and these, I, I mean, I'm, man, I just slammed every space movie ever made, but Sunshine. And Planet of the Apes. I don't, uh, I don't mean to put space films down, but I really like the refreshing approach to, you know what, space is inspiring. And instead of always using how empty and still it is to inspire, sure. why don't we look at the real giddy fucking Neil deGrasse Tyson excited people talking about space kind of stuff. Right. Why don't we show the sun and how magnificent that sure. looks? And how alive space can really be. Exactly. If, exactly. I, mean, th I think that the fact that the premise of the film is essentially space is dying. Yeah. That is... <laughs> space is dying. You know sure. what I mean? But, but, you know, what that says is that space is alive. Well, yeah, I mean, in a couple ways. Um, space is dying and it still looks this great, which is fantastic. Yeah. But in space dying, that is movement. Yeah. You know, space dying is how space was created. Sure. It's how things change and morph over time from the Big Bang to, you know, the, uh, the we are star stuff sure. kind of idea. Um, you see that even in the, I mean, the fucking ship design is still about life. Right. You know, it's not the cold mechanical corridor right. so much. Think about that oxygen room. Right. You know, these well, and fans the full of, yeah. Well, that's what I'm talking about is the you know, kind of the, uh, the fans full of greenery sure. and all the, the garden they're growing. Yeah, but I mean, I'm, I'm talking about when, uh, when Chris Evans character 
gets punished to oh, the earth sure. room. Oh, he that earth room. Yeah, yeah. Sits yeah. with the waves and the forests. Yeah, and, I right. Mean, the the entire ship is based on on sustaining life. Sure. I mean, it's supposed to be a sustainable craft. It's not a cold machine floating through cold space. Yeah. It's a piece of earth trying to translate, you know, the prolonging of earth. Well, and the thing I like about that is we don't have to focus just on those. We don't have to go, oh, in order to put humanity into space, we look at the human right. element in space. Sure. We can also turn the camera outward and go Look at the sun. Isn't yeah. the sun pretty fucking gorgeous? Yeah. You, you know, they have these floor to ceiling kind of observation windows. Mm. Doctor, uh, I think his name's Surly, the the guy in the beginning sure. who's just bathing in sunlight. Mm. The sun has never looked as good as it looks sure. in sunshine. Yeah, I mean, I think about that scene where Mercury passes across oh the face God, of the sun. Man. Yeah, it's, well, it's, it's beautiful and then terrifying following yeah. that up, looking at the ship. Um, with just the rotating darkness right. of the giant fucking celestial body. It's so scary. It's just, um, I mean, the thing that's awe-inspiring to me about space is how overwhelming it is. Yeah, There are very few things, and you kind of get into a religious idea about this, but that could humble you in the way looking at space can. I get that even from looking at you know, if I see, um, if I'm on Google Maps, there was a big thing on Google Maps a while ago talking about the oddities on Google Maps, pops up all the time, uh, a ship that was half sunken in the ocean. Yeah. And being able to look at a satellite view of a ship that's the size of an island sinking into the ocean terrifies me. Something about it just, it scares me. It makes me feel dizzy. I get yeah. vertigo from it. And it's very, uh, it's very humbling to instantly be shrunk down to that position. The uh, the view of the universe here does that too. The view of the sun and how small Mercury is in comparison right. to it. I there's no film I would rather see on a, a hundred inch screen. Sure. In I you know just in IMAX the largest possible. Sure. I just want to be dwarfed by yeah. the things that are happening in sunshine. And that's not lost on the crew either. Right. I mean when Mercury passes by, yeah, they all rush into the room sure. to look at it. You know, you don't get the people who are jaded by space. Oh, yeah, space. We've been here for years. You know, sure. we don't give a fuck about that. How often does that happen in right. space movies? Yes. Oh, we're just hanging out in space. It's well, surprisingly it's just, really boring. I think it just happened in the other film we did. Yeah, right. Well, and the other thing that I really like about Sunshine focusing so much on, you know, the fact that these people know the importance of their mission and they get into the argument about, you know, if this mission fails, what's the fucking point sure. of anything? Sure, sure. And we never once flash back to Earth, flash back to, oh, the news reports are saying that the sun is even colder today. Sure. Than because sure. in all honesty, if this crew doesn't succeed, we're focused on this crew. Yeah. And if this crew doesn't succeed, what's happening on Earth right now is so unimportant. Right. Because Earth is going to die. It's the payoff at the yeah. end, right? That's all it's there for. Yeah. Is, to, is to show us once we're done with space to come back sure. down. Sure. It's, it's never for the setup. Yeah, exactly. This crew is really the most important thing going on in the universe right yeah, now. Yeah. That's why we're here. Yeah. That's why the camera is in the ship and not flashing back to their families on Earth. Sure. I mean, this is this is the last bastion of mankind floating towards a terrifyingly large fireball. Well, we want to stay with those characters too. That's why we see them, you know, fight over recording videos to send back. Killian Murphy's character, there's that uh, transmission in the beginning that, sure. you know, when you think about Sunshine, that's one of the scenes that sticks mm -hmm. out to me a lot. And the way it comes back in the end, we want to talk about how they've been separated from their families and what that means in so much as it informs their characters. So we don't need to see all these cutbacks to Earth. We'll just see what they're sending to Earth and we mm -hmm. can get an idea of that relationship from from that one-sided viewpoint. Sure. It lets us identify with that character a little bit because we don't get to see their family then. Mm -hmm. We just see their loneliness, you know, being recorded. Well, yeah, and the other thing that, I mean, the importance of these scientists and the mission get to is when they're making decisions. They talk, um, they're uh, trying to figure out whether or not they should do the swing over and go to the first Icarus. Yeah, right. And uh, one of the characters says, fine, we'll take a vote and we'll see. And immediately they shoot it down. They say, listen, this is not a democracy. We are scientists. Yeah, we are, uh, we're a collection of scientists and, I guess, physicists, too, yeah. was the other one. Uh, we're going to make the most informed decision possible. I mean, it's perfect. Sure. That's, 
anytime you're in a large group and you have an argument, it seems to be, well, let's go back to democracy. Sure. Let's just take a let's vote. Take a vote. And that doesn't always make the most sense. And the fact that someone could stop, first of all, they were stopping the conversation to go, all right, well, let's figure this out. But it wasn't, you know, it ends up falling back on Killian Murphy's character mm -hmm. rather than being, well, we're an informed group of scientists. So this is why I should get to make the decision. Right. I mean, if there's any dissent from, oh, let's just vote, it's usually, oh, I'm the captain, right. so why don't I just make the decision for you? It's not often presented, well, wait a second, why don't we just As you know, the physicists. look at all the evidence, consult with the physicist, yeah. Well, and then we get into the other weird idea that uh, Killian Murphy's character brings up of choosing whether or not the coin will land on heads or tails. Oh, yeah. As opposed to um, guessing. Yeah. He says, at this point, it's a guess. It's like asking me to choose to you know decide whether a coin will land on heads or tails when right, you flip it right he's in a situation where he has to make a decision on something completely chance yeah and he says fuck that i don't need the excuse of always blaming the coin yeah you know i'm gonna make this decision now and live with the repercussions and my god michael do they live with the repercussions yeah. or basically don't live with right. the repercussions that's uh another one of my favorite things about sunshine is that as much as you think back to this movie, uh, you know, as people being murdered and kind of uh, maybe even one in that genre of event horizon type weird mm -hmm. space movie death sure. things, uh, most of this crew dies because of their decisions. Right. The vast majority of them. Uh, you could make the argument all of them die because yeah. of their decisions. But, you know, they decide to go to this other ship and that diversion causes damage to the, you know, the heat shield right. or whatever. Trey yep. fucked up in that moment. Yep. That was him making those calculations. But I mean, you know, he blames himself a lot. They put him on suicide watch or whatever. Sure. But that's, uh, it was so last minute. There's no oversight there. I mean, I don't really feel like I blame Trey necessarily. You know, when you set up a space mission, you think about every little detail forever. Mm -hmm. You have committees, go over your details, you at least sleep on them, right? Right. Trey was basically asked, hey, uh, we're going to run over to that um, you know, ship over there. If you Get could just, set up uh, for us. Yeah, if you could just change all the equations, that'd be great. As if they're stopping at a fucking gas station or something. Right. And so he gets everything mapped out and forgets one little thing. And, you know, no one double checked his work. I feel bad for Trey. Yeah. Cassie ends up moving the ship to shade them, you know, sacking the comm towers. Just we're going to get rid of those. We're not. That's when you start to see this as a one way trip. Yep. So, well, we're going to need those to get back. Uh, we'll worry about that later. Let's worry about what's in front of us right now. And that's when you get the fire in the garden. And um, I think the character's name is uh, Corazon. She rushes to, you know, to save that garden. You get the flash fire. Mace mm -hmm. decides. To, Mace is kind of the dickish one yeah. in all of these decisions. Right. He's the one who always makes what some might argue is the necessary and calculated decision in order to, you know, you have all of humanity hanging in the balance. Sure. I uh, need to make sure this mission goes off correctly. Sometimes you have to make these decisions that are the fucking worst thing ever. Right. But that makes him the asshole on the crew because he won't save the one human being who is their friend uh -huh. over the however many billion people are on right. Earth at this yeah. point. She doesn't die in that fire, but it's framed uh, because the fire fills that glass and she's standing there. Mm -hmm. Every time it happens, I'm always surprised when she pops up later. Right. Just, oh, didn't you die in a horrific fire three <laughs> scenes ago? Oh, no, you were just watching your garden burn to the ground. So the garden would be the first life that's yeah. extinguished uh, on the ship. But then that ship tries to move the heat shield back while, you know, they're out there. And Cassie fights against it. But uh, Mace disagrees, and they end up losing the captain yep. out there. The two ships, you know, disconnect later, and Surly, you know, stays behind to basically be burnt up in sure. that ship, like their their crew. That's the moment that reminds me of that Event Horizon thing. Sure, you know, finding the ship and the Event Horizon. It was a rape demon orgy or something. Yeah, but. Here, uh, you get those kind of quick flashes as they're exploring the ship every time the, the beam of light, the flashlight, yeah. kind of goes across the screen, which is really, I mean, the fact it's not something scary, but instead vacation photos, uh -huh. uh, it's really terrifying. <laughs> the first time you see that, I, you know, the more I watch Sunshine, the less it scares the fuck out of me. Right. But God, the first time I saw it and you're getting vacation photos or happy crew. Yeah. Oh, it's just weird. I don't know what's going on. It's terrifying. 
Harvey freezes in space. Yep. So then Harvey's gone. These are all because of the decisions that the crew's making. And then they get back in. And I'm kind of curious to get your take on this because I feel like Trey kills himself. Uh huh. But it's also at a beat in the story where now there's someone on the ship. Sure. I think I I definitely still think it's a suicide. I don't think yeah. that there. Yeah. I mean, I don't think that there's any reason for Pinbacker to have killed him yeah. at that point. You know. So Pinbacker would be the other guy on the ship. And any other day, we might do a whole show just talking about the first couple acts of Sunshine. Uh, because it's really amazing. Yeah. There's a whole fucking commentary on the DVD um, of Brian Cox just giving... He was the science advisor. Uh-huh. Um, that's probably a really generic term. I'm sure he does something more important than advise science. How yeah. vague and broad is that? But just talking about things that Sunshine got right, uh-huh. where it used its artistic license, I'm going to sure. say, instead of getting things wrong. It's a movie that has a great respect for space and does all of these uh, really incredible things around it. But there's a kind of bear or no bear moment uh-huh. where there becomes a more pressing issue yeah. going on. And we can't sit around and look at the sun and think about how gorgeous space is sure. anymore. So we've had this majority of the film where everybody has died because of human error or failure or poor decisions. Or maybe it was necessary. Sure. I don't know. They're trying to set off a bomb in the right. sun. This is kind of important. Uh-huh. They made sacrifices. And then there's Pinbacker, whose name has to be a reference to the oh, previous yeah. film. No, right? it's definitely a fucking reference back to has to be yeah it's a weird name so instead of just talking about the first two acts and then making a joke about there being a monster in the third act and Uh moving on to what we're going to do next time i really want to talk to you about this because it's so uh divisive it's usually the reason people love or hate sunshine comes down to this third act Mm -hmm. and it's not just a tonal turn it's something that i wonder if it could be looked at you know in as intellectual way as the rest of the movie can. Right. The character is interesting to me because this is our one holdover from the old ship. Yeah. And so, you know, you want to get background on this person and the movie, um, you know, talks about him being a religious person. That's every time he says something, it's about them challenging God in yeah. one way or another, which could be enough just to get on my good side. Sure. Anyways, that's fine. Use the third act of your glorious space movie to just make a character mock religion. But he flipped out and killed his team, mm-hmm. and he thought God wanted him to. It's um, it's the problem you get, and you and I have talked about this a lot. And it's the opening of of uh, Pendulette's book, which is really great, uh-huh. called God No. The exact opening, I I don't remember. I should just have it tattooed on the inside of my eyelids. But it's talking about how if you truly believe in God, mm-hmm. you really think that there is a a creator who is more important than anything, and controls all, then you will listen to anything he says. Right. You have to, right? It's God. You can't not listen to God. What, are you going to question his (laughs) judgment? You know what I mean? It's fucking God, man. I believe the the actual thing our producer liked when I say was, it's the fucking devil. Wasn't that her favorite thing I ever said? Yeah. No, it's fucking God, man. So uh, God says, kill your whole crew. And the problem with believing in God is if he says, kill your whole crew, then you have to kill your entire crew. Right. That's just the thing you got to do. God told you to. Yep. It kind of reminds me back when we talked about contact. I do like oh, just space movies where God is causing problems. Uh-huh. You know what I mean? For people who believe in God. But there is another part of me that, you know, laughs off his belief in God and says his real problem is that he didn't spend enough time in the earth room. Yeah. He's a psychopath. Yep. And maybe that's why they put so many goddamn doctors and psychologists sure. and whatever on the ship is uh, people need to spend more time in the earth room, chilling out, make sure they don't go psychotic. He's gone psychotic. And it's one of, uh, I think the state we see him in is part of the effects of isolation in space. Sure. I don't think I could make the argument that that's why he killed them in the first place. Right. I mean, you and I weren't there. We don't know what happened on that ship. Yeah. But what idea do you get about why did he kill that Yeah, crew? I think, I mean, there, it's just got to be a moment where he snapped and the righteousness of his own mentality shifted. Yeah. He, his, I mean, he became defensive of something. Yeah. And what for whatever reason, the crew was a threat to that. I mean, the only thing I can assume is that he was trying to defend the sun from being reignited. Sure. You know, that that suddenly sure. became a bad idea. Yeah. And that the crew was, that was exactly what they were going to do. You're flying a ship into the sun. You start seeing, I mean, I was describing earlier how overwhelmed I am by space. Sure. I could see where someone might make the connection that the sun is God. You right. You know, that uh, suddenly God is telling them, hey, don't set off this bomb in the sun. 
So for whatever reason, he flips out, he kills everybody. But I don't think he was, I mean, by definition, I don't think he could have been as bad as when we see him. Right. Because he's fucked up. Yeah. And I think a lot of that is the isolation in space. It's uh, Surly becoming addicted to, you know, that sort of unfiltered viewing of the sun. You start to see this in all of our crew. Mm -hmm. You see when they're at odds with each other, they fight over these strange little things. Um, Surly was watching videos of the first crew, you know, trying to understand oh, what happened there? And you hear them talk about the beauty and the magnificence of the sun, and I think that's kind of where his obsession begins. Then you have Trey, who possibly killed himself for right. making a mistake. You know, So you see this breakdown of the crew, and then you think, well, Pinbacker, he was in space seven years sure, obsessing over the sun. Right. Seven fucking years. So he's going to be a complete nut job yeah. from isolation or not. Yeah. It's alone seven years. I'm going to chalk it up to isolation. You were in uh, normal for what, two months before? <laughs> I Yeah, it was two months before I went crazy. Before you went blurry? Well, I, was a little, I was a little blurry uh, when I started there, but I, I think I only stayed nine months. <laughs> and uh, it was, man, those first couple months of me coming back and talking to your group of friends yeah it was a little uh, it was a little nutty <laughs> they seem to be amused by it which is why i'm still in chicago and we have mutual friends yeah. i suppose i also like to think that maybe he's fuzzy because there's radiation that's yeah. my that's my excuse for the visual gimmick that's possible you don't need an excuse for you know later no. in the movie the editing uses uh freeze frames makes it look like your dvd skipped yep they don't need a reason to do that. Yeah. That's just the style of the movie. That's sure. the aesthetic they went with. I'll defend that. But the the thing that even got me thinking about Surly and his fascination with the sun is I feel like that was almost kind of foreshadowing to Pinbacker. Uh -huh. It was this kind of parallel of a guy who is obsessed with God or maybe obsessed with the sun itself. And you're seeing how that could have been developing in one of the characters on this ship. Had a few things been a little bit changed, he would have been mentally a little bit off. Or maybe he would have had the idea of religion to enable him. Mm -hmm. He could have become Pinbacker given enough time or, right. or one of those other circumstances. The other thing that I could consider is that Pinbacker, I mean, he's been sitting, when they find him, he's in the sun observation room yeah. at dangerous levels of sun sure. radiation. And it's possible that he is just this representation. I mean, say there's a spirit in the sun or what the fuck ever. Yeah. But he's the representation of. I mean, the angel of death to the sun. Yeah. He is the last thing that the crew has to overcome, the physical representation of what they're trying to prevent. Sure. They've come this close to reigniting the sun, and they are face-to-face -face with stopping the sun's death. Yeah. I mean, that's what he represents, is he is the hand-to-hand -hand fucking fist fight sure. with the sun dying. He's the manifestation of that death, too. Yeah. He is uh, this character who is decayed sure. and dying. And all they need to do is blow him up right. and get to the sun. If they know? can get past him, they can set the sun back up. Sure. It's an example of just how they have to put everything they have into the success of this mission. What that character lets the movie ultimately accomplish is uh, use a couple horror tactics yeah. in order to create a, an antagonist at the end of the film right. for them to overcome. So it's not, otherwise it's just going to start looking like blind stupidity right. as why they couldn't set off a bomb. Well, uh, and you're going to start looking for, you're going to start looking for an antagonist and it'll be uh, what the second in command who becomes captain. Like sure, the sure. film doesn't want you to hate anybody on the crew. The right. film doesn't want any of them to come off as the bad guy. They've made mistakes because they're human. Sure. But if you can pin all the, the real negativity on the inhuman angel of death. Yeah. All the better. Yeah, let's make religion the villain. Let's make isolation and scary space and religion the villain of the film. Because why wouldn't you? Next time on Double Feature, we got a couple more movies. You we do. You can find out what they are at doublefeatureshow.com. The, the email address is doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. Let us know how much you love chapters. Yeah, let us know all about that. We got some more chapters for you next time and more films yeah. as well to we have, uh, utilize those chapters. Uh, we're doing Bound and Strangers on a Train. Getting the fuck out of space. We're, uh, we're doing some, what, Hitchcock and Wachowski? That's exactly what that is. All right, watch more fucking film. Bye.